John chapter number 5. I say that about eight times before each one, but that's just to make sure the buttons are pushed right. Uh, John 5, if you will, verse number 1. We are coming into the third miracle in the book of John, the Gospel of John. And uh, we're, after last week, we finished the second miracle. And then I kind of made a comment about, you guys remember when we did the eight? So we're going to kind of look at the eight again so we get that in our heads. And then uh, we'll uh, see if we can have time then to get into the, the first component here for uh, the third miracle. Um, John, there are eight miracles in the Gospel of John. If you hold on here and run to chapter 20, chapter number 20, and verse number 30 and 31, here's why there's only eight miracles in the Gospel of John. Now, the Lord did other miracles. Many, actually, He did so many. Uh, if you turn the page to the end of chapter 21, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. <laughs> Amen. So He obviously does a bunch of stuff. If you look at 20 and verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now watch verse 31. But these are written that ye might, what? Believe. See, there's only eight because the eight miracles that are in John are designed to cause Israel the little flock ultimately, but to cause Israel to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name. So when you come back to chapter 5 and we start the third miracle, what the eight miracles are going to do is go back to chapter 1. All right, put this all together. Chapter 1, verse 11, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. That is a, that's, he begins the Gospel of John the way that Matthew, Mark, and Luke end. He came to his own, his own received him not. That's how Matthew, Mark, Luke end. John starts there and says, okay, this is a condition. Verse 12, here's why there's only eight. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The eight miracles are designed to show and to demonstrate that Jesus is the Son of the living God, and they would believe that. But for him to then turn and demonstrate how he's going to transform them, how is he going to give them the power to become the sons of God? Now, we've been looking at it across the way, and it's really through the New Covenant. And, and we see that, but the Lord is involved in it. So when we come into chapter 5, and we start the third um, miracle here, I want to, and, and it runs from verse 1 to verse 16. So let's just read it, get it into your thinking, and then we'll uh, leave the text far hence, as the old preacher said. But anyway, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. That's going to be key when we get down into the... All, actually, every word in this is key. It's, it's just phenomenal. <clears throat> Verse 6, When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the water. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Uh-oh. 
The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Now, that's the You start in verse 17 and get into some other stuff there, but that's the third miracle. Now, the first miracle was over there in chapter 2, where he turns the water into wine. They're at the wedding. There's no joy, because they're out of wine. And he changes the water to wine and puts it into those clay pots, those earthen vessels. And when we looked at that and we studied that out, we saw that the The water is a type of the Word, by the washing of the water by the Word. The washing of water by the Word, Paul says it in Ephesians. And what did he do? He took his Word and he put it in them. When the Word goes in them, what do they have? Great joy. Okay? The second miracle we just looked at in chapter 4, with the nobleman and the son being healed. Now, the sun isn't there, the sun's off, but the nobleman did what? He believed the word. So then faith becomes an issue. You have the word, but you also have to have faith in the word. You remember when we looked at it, uh, the nobleman asked the servants, when did this happen? And they said yesterday. The nobleman didn't even run home right after the Lord said, your son's healed. (laughs) He spent the night, you know, took it easy. Had a nice meal. Said, I'll get there in the morning. The train leaves at nine. We'll get there. He just, he was completely relaxed. So you have the word and then you have faith. And then in this third one here, you're going to find and see the issue of the grace of God. Because when you have the word and you have faith, then the next thing on the ticket is his grace. And his grace is there in verse number. Six, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? And what did the guy say? I've been this way, but I have nobody to help me get in. What does God's grace do for Israel? When they're in the moment when they can't do it themselves, what does his grace do? I'll do it for you. I'll take care of you. That's what the new covenant is all about. By the way, it's the same for you and I. You can run parallelisms in this. We have to have the Word in us. We have to believe the Word. And that's going to bring us to the issues of understanding the grace of God. And look at what He's done for us. So you've got all that. The same for you and I. Just Israel's program, the content of the message is different than ours. But the same principles are are identical. So... I said last time, Miracle 1 and Miracle 2 are bookends because what happens in between them, he goes to Jerusalem. What does he find in Jerusalem? A defiled temple. What does he do? Cleans the temple out. Okay. Then he goes over and he deals with Nicodemus, a type of the dead leadership, leadership in, of the nation of Israel that's dead and darkened and no spiritual understanding at all. Then he goes to Judea. What's happening in Judea? They are rejecting John the Baptist's ministry and then the Lord's ministry as as the Father moves the ministry from John over to the Lord. Remember they said to him, Hey, John, what do you think? Jesus has got, he's got you beat tonight, two to one in attendance. What do you think? Trying to jump, you know, now that's the RJ of it. But he's, what are they trying to do? We got rejection. Then where does the Lord go? To Samaria. On his way here to Galilee, Canaan of Galilee, he goes to Samaria, 
And what do we see in Samaria? We see the hard-heartedness of Israel towards the Samaritans. But yet the Samaritans do what? They believe. They hear the word, they believe, and they have a great harvest. Who's, what's the problem? Samaria is ready. Um, the Magi, the, the wise men that come, they're Gentiles out of Babylon. They're ready to hear the king of the Jews. Who's not ready? Israel, Jerusalem, Judea. Okay? So you've got all that. So at the point where Israel, at the end of the, at, when, when it's time to do the uh, miracle two, they're at a point of death, really, of destruction. There's nothing in Israel but death and destruction. And yet, he heals the nobleman's son. He's restored by Jesus Christ. He's put the word in him in a miracle, joy, gladness in the water pots. Then they come and the nobleman believes it. And what does he do? He restores the son by faith. So you've got these bookends that kind of, with stuff going on in the middle, and here they are. And really what the first two miracles are doing is showing that Jesus Christ is really their answer. And he's going to be the answer for the restoration of Israel. Now, the third miracle here, the impotent man, he's powerless. No energy. He, 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 he can't perform. See that? Now, what's going to happen with this guy? Come over to Acts 3, just real quick. What's going to happen with this guy is we're going to find out that he's actually a wonderful picture of the spiritual condition in Israel because of the, of the law and because of the impact of the law. Now, the law is the opposite of what? Grace. So, the law did this to you. God, the, or the son's going to, Jesus is going to say, I'm going to do grace and truth for you. Which one do you want? Moses has already told Israel, I set before you death and life. Please choose life. They chose death. <laughs> you know, going to do it our way. Acts chapter 3, the first eight verses, you have another lame man at the temple with Peter and John. And if you will look at verse 7, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. This will be Peter. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, this is Peter's first miracle in the Acts period after the ascension of the Lord. The Lord's first miracle, which is the water pots and the, the water to wine in Cana of Galilee, Peter's first miracle, which is right here. Paul's first miracle, which is the blinding of the Jew, are all dispensational type miracles in that they paint the picture of what each ministry is going to be about. The Lord is to bring joy and faith and restoration back to the nation of Israel by taking them into the kingdom, because that's where all that's going to happen. Peter, who's Peter? He's the, head, he's the head of the twelve. He's the main guy. John is, he's main guy part B. <laughs> he's not too, but Peter has all of, the, uh, all of the responsibility. But what was, remember a couple weeks ago, I showed you that thing about the Lord says, I'm here to do his will and to finish the work he gave me. And that that work that he gave him wasn't Calvary, but rather it was this issue of training up the little flock to take over when he's gone and out. Well, what's Peter going to do here in, in Acts 3? Peter, i.e. little flock, is going to do what? They're going to pick up lame, impotent, no way to get in Israel and take them where? Where does he go into? Into the temple, see? So Peter's just the next thing. Now Paul, with the blinding of the Jew, Elimaeus over there, what is he saying? Blindness has now happened to the Jews, and the word's going, salvation's going to the Gentiles without you guys. Okay, so you've got, you've got to all kind of think about all that. All the miracles in the Bible are there for a reason. They're all designed to teach and to educate the reader, the people in case, in our case in John. Go back there to John 
in John 5. In John is Israel, but when Paul does it, it's to provoke Israel to jealousy. But Romans also says it is to help the Gentiles understand what's going on because the Gen- Paul didn't write. Paul had no books written. So what were the Gentiles going to do? They're seeing the same stuff being done going, you know what, that guy's got God on his side. Okay? And that's Romans 15. I say all that. I'll give you the right verse. Hang on a second. <clears throat> yeah, Romans 15, verse number 18 and 19. So Romans 15, 18, he says, For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. So Paul was preaching to the Gentiles. When he's sitting on the island over there and that viper comes out and bites him, who's his audience when that happens? No Jew in that audience. It's all heathen Gentiles. They see the viper hit him, bite him, throws it off. He should have been dead. He's not dead. What do you think they're thinking? There's something weird about this guy. And he does what? Well, the rest of that verse in Romans 15 says, I preach the gospel of Christ from Jerusalem around Dili Ikram. I've, you know. Well, what'd they do? They listened to the word, but what caused them to stop and listen? There was an activity. And always with um, the miracles, miracles are designed to teach the doctrine that has already been taught. Okay, the miracle, there, you you got John 5, right? There are, in miracles, there are sometimes doctrine taught, but when you back up and you study it out, he's already taught the doctrine over here. The miracle just follows it up. Um, Luke 8, the first verse, he says that Jesus was preaching and showing the things pertaining to the kingdom. What's he doing? Preaching, but then doing the miracle to show and to demonstrate it, okay? All right, so you've got chapter, you got the first two miracles. And I'm going to mess up the nice clean board. Then, oh, I know. James, okay. Then you have the fourth miracle, which is in chapter 6, which is the feeding of the 5,000. Then you have the fifth miracle, which is in chapter 7. I'm sorry, chap, chapter 6, the end of 6, where he calms the water in the storm. Then the sixth miracle is in chapter 9, where, he, where the blind man receives his sight. The seventh miracle is in chapter 11 with Lazarus. And the eighth miracle is in chapter 21, when, he, when they're out fishing and they couldn't catch the fish. And he says, hey, throw it on the other side. And, and the disciples do that, and they come in. And, but when they get in, what's he got cooking on the stove? On the, campfire already, fishes, and they have great fellowship. So what each one of these miracles, again, is designed to demonstrate the issue in in chapter 1, verse 12, the key verse to the whole of the gospel. That is, they're demonstrating the transforming power that Israel needs to become the sons of God, but that power is going to come from be founded and provided by the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, when you come to the miracles, and I know we did this, but this is lesson 43 or whatever, and we're down the road quite a ways. When you talk about these miracles, (coughs) the first three miracles are how he's going to do verse 12. Okay? By the way, number three. Remember what that number is in in our numerology? The number of resurrection. The number of restoration. What's he going to do? We got the Word in them. They're believing the Word. Now I'm going to restore them. And how I restore them is by my grace. God's going to provide for them. The first miracle, and I'm going to do it the way we did it, the other day, the first miracle is the Word. He gets the Word in them. The second miracle is the issue of faith. They believe the Word. The third miracle is going to be the grace of God. So first, it's the Word of God. 
through the faith of man in the Word, and now it's going to be the grace of God. So there's a, there's a little thing there. Jesus Christ is going to be, he, he is always in, with Israel here, the initiator. And really, he's always that way with us, too. Jesus Christ, he's the one that's going to provide what man can't provide. Look in verse 6. What does he say to the guy? You're sick. You want to be made whole. What does the guy say to him back in verse 7? Sir, I have no what? Man who can put me in the water when it's troubled. And by the time I can get myself over there, somebody else has done jumped in and it's, it's one for the show and that's it. I'm out of luck. This guy can't provide for himself, can he? No energy. You, but what does God's grace do? Does it for him? What he couldn't do for himself, the grace of God does for this guy. And he says, hey, rise, take up thy bed and walk, man. You're on your way. Let's go. And the guy goes, by the way, healing is complete, total, instantly. I always, I always get a kick out of guys who go to people who go to healing meetings and they got to go back next week to get the rest of them fixed. No, <laughs> doesn't work that way in Scripture. When this man is healed, the guy in Acts 3, when he's healed, it's immediately, the verse says, and it's all of it. He didn't have to go back for an adjustment. You know, It was interesting. There was a gentleman who was a friend of Dad's uh, for many years. Uh, he was in the Korean War, and he got cut in half by a machine gun in the war. So he lived almost all of his life, a majority of his life, in a wheelchair. He went to go to one of these healing meetings. They wouldn't let him in the building. So he sat outside. Now, he's a grace believer, and he understands. He's, but he's also in the desperate desires of the mind, wanting to be fixed. Okay? So he's sitting there. Well, there's a lady that's walking up, and she's limping with a cane. They put her in a wheelchair and rolled her down front. Now think about what's going to happen when the preacher says, get up and write. What can she do? She can get up. Oh, look at that. He, don't, they don't sh and, and then they told the lady, according to Johnny, he's, he's passed away now. He said, then she turned around and pushed the wheelchair back up the ramp. Oh, look. Woo, look at that. Well, it covered up her limp. Because, <laughs> you know, so... When you look at healing in Scripture, it's complete, total, head-to-toe, it's done. It's never to be revisited again. And honestly, if those guys could heal, then they would be emptying out the hospitals and we wouldn't need Obamacare. It would be done. Everybody would be fine, okay? <laughs> but such is the case because how's God not working that way? The issue here in the third miracle is going to end up being their salvation is by God's grace through faith in God's Word. And that is how it always works no matter where you're at on the dispensational timeline. No matter where you're at, Genesis to Revelation, salvation is always going to work through faith, by God's grace, through faith in God's Word. Ephesians 2.8, that's how it works every time. Again, the content of His Word changes. Israel had her program. We have ours, but guess what? It's still by His grace through faith in His Word to you and I, to them. Okay, Always remember that. And if you can remember that, then we'd love to see you Saturday at the Men's Fellowship, but that's pretty much where we're coming from. And, it, and it's important. When you take the eight miracles and... We might, we'll just probably do this and then we'll start the chapter next time because I, I want to do this because we're on number three and I want you to see kind of what's happening here. In Bible study, when you read the whole, like, like you take John, you take the 21 chapters and you read John 1 to 21 all in one setting and you do that a number of times and I have. You begin to see, and, and you're reading. You're not running rabbit trails. You, just, you begin to see little things show up that begin to connect. The miracles are that way. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. 
Now, that's a poor, because I didn't do it down far enough, did I? Okay, it should be right there, so it should be here, here, and here. This line in Greek is called a chi, chiasm. So one corresponds with eight, two is going to correspond with seven, three with six, and then four and five go together. Now, it works wonderful with eight. You see that? All right? But go so three is going to connect with six. In chapter six, there are two of them I gave you, right? You remember that? Well, it's the calming of the water. Okay? Look over, let me show you another one just so you can see this. Look, look at Ephesians 4 with me. And, and again, if you ever see this in a book, if you read any of, of Bullinger's books or if you read any uh, of some of the old time writer guys, they write like this. This is how they outline stuff. You take Bullinger's Companion Bible and he's got stuff going all over. But it's this, it doesn't, it's not wrong. It's just more detail than some of us are really wanting to know. <laughs> look, at, look at Ephesians 4, and look at with me at verse number 4. You see the ones? What's the first one? The body. That's number one. What's the second one? Spirit. Right? What's the third one? Hope. Right? What's the fourth one? Lord. What's the fifth one? What? Faith. Fa okay, thank you. <coughs> Faith. Six is baptism. And seven, God the Father. Do you see the chi there? Body, Father. What is the Father doing today? He's forming the body of Christ, is he not? Okay. How do we get in? We're baptized by one spirit, right? We have a hope that's faith-based. We have a faith that's got a hope. But wait a minute. This guy is all by himself. You see that? You know why? Because he's the key to all of it. We don't have the body without him. The Father isn't going to work without him. This isn't going to work. None of this works without who? The Lord. See how that worked? That's an, so the chi doesn't always have to have an even number. But whenever it's an odd number, the middle is the key to understanding the rest of it. Follow that? All right. Thus concludes the Bible study. <laughs> no. Look at five, go back to John 5. Okay? Yeah. Well, you know, but again, you can do this. You can be, just, if you just start reading, you take the book of Philippians, you do this with Philippians all day long. Philippians is, there, there are four key verses in Philippians in each chapter. Okay? Philippians 1, verse 21, and, and by the way, they're all about Christ. The first one is, is, is Christ is my life, 1 verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. My life is Christ. The second one is in chapter 2, verse number 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ. There's a new mind. My life and a new mind. Then you have the third one which is in 310, which is the goal of life, which is to do what? To know Him and the power of His resurrection. Then in chapter 4, verse 13, you have the third issue, which is, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthen me. I have strength in my life because of who? Christ. So you've got, a three, you've got four issues there, and you can lay them, they'll lay right out just that way, because who's, in, who's the issue? Christ is the issue, but I have, a, I have a life that has strength in it, and I have a goal in my life, and that is to have a new mind and a new thinking mechanism. See that? You follow? So you can do that. And, and this is the stuff. 
James and I were talking beforehand. This is the stuff that gets you excited. I, I remember the first time I saw that, I couldn't sit still. I, I, I did. I went, I was like, man, that is so cool. <laughs> you know, the inner man was just jumping. It was like, you know, okay, well, let's do a little jump, you know. <laughs> I didn't get very far off the ground. But the thing is, you get excited about it. Why? Because that's Bible study. Anyway, go back to chapter 1. Uh, chapter 5 of John, I'm sorry, verse 1. <clears throat> Chapter 5, verse 1, after this there was a feast. So you see how it says after this? So we got something new now, don't we? We got the moments here. We, we, we've got something that, that's coming after this. Well, we just had something good, didn't we? In, in, in that second miracle, the healing there. Now we're going to have the next one. Now when you talk about these miracles, here's the word. Here's faith. Here's going to be God's grace. Okay? He's going to feed the... F oh, excuse me. Oh, yeah, it's just my... I, he's going to f uh, feed the 5,000. Okay? He's going to calm the waters. He's going to raise the blind man. Give him sight. Okay? Number seven, you've got Lazarus, and he's a dead man, isn't he? And then you've got eight, and I'm just going to write fellowship. Okay, you see that? The first one is word. I'm sorry, word. And this is faith. Where do we have, where do they, and if I say we, I'm talking about Israel, where do they have their fellowship in the Word? See that? What gets them out of being dead? Their faith in the Word, right? What made the blind man to see? God did that. He couldn't do it. God had to do it. His grace did it. The feeding of the 5,000, they're a little concerned, aren't they, about where we're going to get our food. What did he do? Calmed them right down. See, these, they begin to, to balance each other. Number three, since that's where we're at, and number six, they're both at a pool. They're both on the Sabbath day done. So we have a Sabbath day issue. Jesus Christ, by the way, gets in trouble in both Miracle 3 and Miracle 6, because he did it on the Sabbath day, and there's people mad at him now. Okay? In both of them, sin is dealt with. When we talk about the sheep market, that's really the sheep gate in the temple area, and who, who was brought to the sheep gate were the sacrificial sheep, and they were so, sold there for the feast and for the sacrificing, which is all of that stuff in Israel's program about paying for the penalty of Sin, the shedding of blood and everything. Both deal with sin. Uh, both men involved have long-standing infirmities, 38 years. The blind man's been blind from birth, but his age is given as well over there. There's time elements that are... In, by the way, the ages and stuff are timing. Very important to get. They're both at Jerusalem. They both talk about Moses and going and do. They, they're, they're both, uh, they both don't know who did it to them. When they are a question, they go, we don't know, and then later he, he reveals who did it to them. So you got a lot of these things begin to kind of similar and pull out there. They have a lot of progression to what's going on. And again, number one, the water to wine, he takes the sadness and he makes them glad with the word. The nobleman's son is healed. His health comes back. How does his health come back? Because he believed. The disease is gone. Here in, in chapter 5, they're, they're, the impotent folks, they're powerless. They're paralyzed. What does he do? He gives them their strength back. They're hungry. He, he's going to feed them with bread. Who's the bread? He's the bread. The Word is the bread, isn't it? Two? 
See, uh, you just you, boy, you can just play with this stuff all night long. The calming the storm down. He gives them peace. The blindness, the blind man, he's got light. See? With Lazarus, if he's dead, what does the Lord give him? Life. And then you have fellowship, which, by the way, is out there in the kingdom, right? The first issue there in the marriage is about the kingdom. Same thing. So when you begin to draw the parallelisms here, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They were joyless. They were at the point of death, miracle two. Miracle three, no ability to perform, can't get in the pool. Miracle four, they're hungry, no provisions. Miracle five, they're in the throes of destruction and that storm and everything. Number six, they're blinded. Number seven, they're dead. Number eight, the guys out in the boat fishing, you know what they did when they couldn't catch them? They gave up. So when he comes into his own, and his own received him not, that's the condition that they're in, that the, these eight, at every point. Now, the dialogue that happens... In between each one. We saw it between one and two. We'll see it between three and four. The dialogue between them is designed to amplify the miracles that are going to be done. One and two. Since we've already seen that, right? What happened in one? He gave them joy, didn't he? Then he went out and what'd they do? They're dead. They reject him. They reject the father. They reject the, well, they reject the Father by rejecting John the Baptist, but they reject him. They completely turn away. They have nothing to do with Samaria. So what happens? He comes in and he brings them faith and a little restoration. So when you get into these guys, it's pretty interesting. All right? Does that help remember where we're at? <laughs> I hope. All right, now we can study. Verse 1. After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at certain season into the pool, and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. As he begins, it's a real sad scene, isn't it, at the sheep market pool? The pool there. The pool has a name called Bethesda, which means house of mercy. So here at the house of mercy, there are five porches. And laying, by the way, do you know what the number five is? Death. That's the number five in your Bible, is death. Who's laying on the five porches? The impotent folks, aren't they? No strength. They, they're basically, there's no strength to help themselves. So then what would they be? What would they be? They'd be dead, wouldn't they? Now, they are impotent folks. That's the big title. The blind and the halt and the withered are the details of their imp why they're impotent is because they have these issues, okay? Blind, are, they, their eyes don't work. Halt, they can't walk. Withered, their hands are withered up. They can't go and do. And what are they doing at the pool? They're waiting, aren't they? They're waiting for the pool to be moved by an angel. <laughs> they're not waiting for who? The Messiah. See that? What does he say down there in verse 7? Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in the pool. Who's he waiting for? They're waiting for man, aren't they? They should be waiting for who? Messiah. Now, what happens is, just by the way, I'll say this because I'm thinking about it. You see where it says, for an angel went down at the pool and all that stuff? I'll be honest with you, I don't know if that's 
God doing that, or if that's just what the superstition is, that they were waiting for something miraculous to happen, okay? Because the text doesn't tell you that the angel came from who? From God. And who's working with angels also at this time? Satan is, and the satanic policy of evil, and the demons, and the demon possession in Israel. So you can't, but what the point isn't that they're waiting for an angel. The point is, is they're waiting for someone other than the Messiah. And that's the point. And the picture here is a picture of the spiritual condition of Israel at this time. What are they? Blind, halt, and withered. No strength, no power, no ability to go and to do. See? Verse 1, after this there was a... Feast of the Jews. Now, that's an interesting thing. It's not the, it should be the feast of who? The Lord. Because that's what they're called back in the, in the Old Testament. By the way, the, the five is a number of death. Remember I said that? What's the first five books of your Bible called? The law. The Pentateuch, but the law. What did the law bring? Death. See? By the law, oh, I just had the verse. <laughs> uh, no, you, it's okay. I've been up. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. What are they doing? They're trying to get this done where? In their flesh. They're waiting for a man. They're waiting for someone to come along and help them. The problem is, is they're not waiting for the right guy. But remember that issue of the law, because that's going to come up here in, in just a second. Now, real quick, the Feast of the Jews. A, a lot of questions come up about which one is it and what's going on here. Well... It's not the Feast of the Lord any longer. It's the Feast of the Jews. And I'm jumping ahead of myself, so let's, let's, just, let's just do that real quick. Okay? First of all, the Feast of the Jews. Come back with me real quick to Deuteronomy 16. Because it's the Feast of the Jews, and they're up at the sheep market. Now, it, so they're at the house of mercy. They've got five porches, the number of death, the number of the law. The law works death. Here's Israel up at the sheep market. Now, the sheep market, you got Deuteronomy 16? All right, good. Go to Nehemiah 3. Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. So it's down by Psalms. Nehemiah 3. When they go back in and build the temple again, here in Nehemiah, Nehemiah 3, verse number 1, then that guy, the high priest, Elashab, Elashab, something like that, the high priest rose up with his brethren the priest, and they builded the sheep gate. And they builded the sheep gate that sanctif and sanctified it and set up the doors of it and so on. These guys, the first gate that they build is the sheep gate. Then they go around and they build, there's a dung gate, there's all these different gates that they build, and they end back at the sheep gate. Because the sheep gate is where the sheep for the sacrifice are to be brought. Okay? Now, I know it says sheep market in John. Same place, sheep gate, sheep market, same place. But what are they doing in the marketplace? They're selling the sacrifice and getting it over there. Why are they doing that? Look at Deuteronomy 16 in verse number 16. Because they have been told that they have to do what? Three times a year come to Jerusalem. Three times in a year shall all the males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, now that's Passover. And if you remember the feast schedule, Passover is day one, and then Unleavened Bread finishes up the week. Passover. 
And in the Feast of Weeks, Acts calls that Pentecost, okay? And in the Feast of Tabernacles, now watch, and they shall not appear before the Lord, how? Empty. So three times a year, come back to John 5. We need to get back over there. Three times a year, all the men in Israel are going to go where? They're going to Jerusalem. They're going to go on Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, okay? And when they go, they're not to come empty-handed. So Israel has a tithe schedule, don't they? There's three of them. One is a government tax. That is That tithe of 10% is on the gross, and it is to go to the Levitical, the Levites, who are in charge of running the government of the, of, of the nation of Israel. They're the high priests. They're the ones in charge. By the way, how many tribes are there? And if everybody's given 10%, what's, how much are they getting? 120%, aren't they? That's the overflow of the blessing that they're supposed to have, that is always talked about, Okay. Malachi 3 says, bring, on, bring in the tithes into the storehouses. Well, when they get to where they're going, what do they have? They're bringing all their stuff, aren't they? Not everybody had money. Some brought pigs. Or, no, no, they didn't bring pigs, sorry. <laughs> uh, see if you're listening. But some bring livestock. Some are bringing cut, what, pigeons, doves, whatever. But they go into the sheep market because that's where all the sacrificial lambs are brought in. And that's where they're sold. Who gets the money? The Levitical people do. Okay. The second tithe is a 10%, and that's a vacation tithe. That's you financing your trip to Jerusalem. Now, we like that one. By the way, the first one's on the gross. The second one's on the net. So when somebody says, do you tithe on the gross and the net? The answer is yes and yes. The third tithe is... The welfare, and that's every three years, and they give a, you know, they give a nickel or whatever, you know, five per ten percent or whatever it is, because it's a work. It works out based upon the first two ties. So really, it ends up being about twenty, what about twenty two, twenty five percent, somewhere in there. Okay. Huh? I, I knew you knew because we had talked about it. So it's it's you know it's right there, twenty one point seven. The man said. So we'll take that. At the sheep gate, what's going on? At the house of mercy, there's a pool, and it's in the feast days. The question gets to be, which feast are we talking about? Well, go to chapter 2 and verse 13. Chapter 2, 13, because most everybody says that this is Passover. And I'm going to say, thanks for playing but I'll show you why I say that. Look at 2.13. And the Jews, what? Passover. Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Chapter 6, verse 4. 6.4. 6, 4. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was what? Nigh. Was nigh. Chapter 11 and verse 55. Chapter 11.55. And the Jews, what? Passover was nigh at hand. Do you see how John tells you what feast he's talking about in 2.13, chapter 6 and chapter 11? You see that? Okay, come to chapter 10 and verse 20. Chapter 10, verse 22. 10.22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was what? Winter. Now, that's going to end up being tabernacles because tabernacles on their schedule is done in the wintertime. Okay? First of all, do you see how John told you what Passover, what the feast was when he talked about Passover? But yet in 5.1, he doesn't tell you that. He just says a feast. So number one, John will tell you which feast it is because it's important for you to know which feast it is. Okay? 1022 is more likely tabernacles because it's that late October time frame and so forth, and, and it's winter time. Look at 7 2, chapter 7 and verse 2. Chapter 7, verse 2. Now, the Jews' feast of <coughs> tabernacles, 
<coughs> excuse me, was at hand. So 5-1 is probably not tabernacles, because who wants to be thrown in the water when it's cold outside? Nobody's going to do that. So what feast sits between Passover and tabernacles? Hey, ding, 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 Pentecost. What sits between them? Three feasts. They go to Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles. What sits in between? Pentecost. Well, I know. Well, what about that chapter 6 there, Rick? We just read 6-4. But did you read all of 6-4? And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. It wasn't there yet. It was what? It's coming, close. Why? What's got to happen before Passover can start happen? Well, you got tabernacles and Day of Atonement and trumpets. You got some other things that have got to happen, which, by the way, those back three feasts, when we studied them, they happen pretty quick. They don't happen spread out. Okay? You with me? So, chapter 5, verse 1 is more than likely Pentecost. Now, let me ask you something. Go back up into chapter 4. And look at verse 35. Say not ye that there are yet how many months? Four months. When do you harvest usually? In the fall. And this is four months prior to the fall. Now if April 14th on our calendar is Passover, okay, and you run out 50 weeks, which is the Feast of Weeks, that's okay, that's going to put you where? June, July, not the fall. That's tabernacles. Okay, all right. 50. 50. Penta is 50. 50 days, I'm sorry, not weeks. Thank you. 50 days. Yeah, you were right. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I know. Okay. 50 days, sorry, 50. So you were late July, okay? Just say, because of the calendar. Well, then the next one coming in harvest time is going to be tabernacles down there. You follow that? Now, the question then gets is, why does he not tell you it's the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks? Well, let me ask you something. In John, what's the Lord doing? He's satisfying the what feast? Passover. Isn't he going to go be the Passover lamb? So John is satisfying Passover, right? Is John, is the Lord satisfying Pentecost? No, look at Acts 2. Who satisfies Pentecost? The coming of the Holy Spirit does. Acts 2, 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 4, and they were all filled with who? The Holy Ghost. The Lord coming is going to satisfy Passover. So John tells you over and over and over, Passover is here, Passover is here. Why? Because the Lord is doing what? Satisfying Passover. He's not going to tell you it's Pentecost because it's not time to do what? Satisfy Pentecost yet. Does that make sense? It does for me. If you agree, great. If not, then it's fine to be, for you to be wrong. Go back to chapter 5. Okay, so when he says the feast here, my understanding would be that it is Pentecost. It is not acknowledged as such because the focus of John is not to fulfill Pentecost, is rather to fulfill Passover. And by the way, the tabernacling, when you understand what tabernacle, what do they do when they're tabernacling? They're moving into the kingdom, and they're getting together in the kingdom. So what's the Lord doing with Israel? Getting them ready to do what? Go into the kingdom. So we talk a little bit about tabernacle, and we'll deal with that. Verse 2, 5-2. Oh, man, we got 10 minutes before the hour's up, even though it's after 8 already. So we're at Jerusalem. After this, the, the, and there was a feast at, of, the, uh, of the Jews, and Jesus went up at Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. So again, the sheep market, the gate there, Bethesda, the house of mercy, and yet there's death everywhere. Um, the reason that they're in the condition in verse 3, and, the, and these lay a great multitude of 
uh, impotent folk. The reason there is, is that they're looking for, the, it, it's because of the, of death. It's because of the law. What did they, what were they, what did they say to the Lord at Mount Sinai? Give it to us, we can do it. And what did it do? It just worked death. What are they waiting for? They're waiting for the moving of the water. That's an interesting thing. Do you, do you remember some water moving in, back in Genesis chapter 1? Verse number 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. They're waiting for God to do something in, in chapter 5. They, they're looking for God to do something. And they're impotent. You got a, a, that picture of their spiritual condition. No strength to keep the law. They, they're, they're, they can't, they're blinded. They can't see. They're halt. They can't walk. Their feet are deformed. They're withered hands. They don't work. So you've got, and by the way, that is a great picture of humanity. Period. Not just Israel. Romans 5 and verse number 6, he says that yet while we were without strength, Christ died for us. So, okay, there's more in that verse, but we're what? We're ungodly. We were without strength. We were blind. 2 Corinthians 4, he says, though our gospel be hid, the, 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 Satan has blinded the minds of the lost. We're halt. We, we're, we're, uh, Romans 3 talks about there's none that seek after God. We can't get there. We can't walk there. We fall short. We're withered. It's weak through the flesh. We, we just doesn't work. They're waiting here. And they're waiting for the moving of the waters. And they're waiting for something. Now, there's a great correlation to this. Come over to Luke 2. Because there's another group in Israel that are waiting, or that were waiting. And you see them here in Luke 2. You guys okay? We can kind of wrap this up. We're good? I got what? Five. Okay. Luke 2, look at verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Who's he waiting for? He's waiting for the, redeem the, the Redeemer of Israel, isn't he? Down in verse 36. And there was one Anna. And you know what? She's waiting. Verse 38, and and she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake unto him of all them that looked for the, what? Redemption in Jerusalem. See that? So there is a group waiting, and who are they waiting for? The Messiah. But then you got these other Yehus over here in chapter 5. They're waiting for God to do something. They don't have the ability to perform, and they're waiting. But they're not waiting for the Messiah. They're waiting for man that vain, empty religion of Israel to do what? Come along, pick them up, and put them in, and it isn't happening. Let's come back to John 5. So again here with these guys, you get a great picture of the condition in Israel spiritually and the fact that they are they're waiting, but they're waiting for the wrong thing. The fact is, is that they're impotent. They have no strength, no power to... Satisfy the law. Paul calls the law weak and beggarly elements. That's what they are. They're waiting for God to come over and move the waters. Verse 4, for an angel went down at, cer at a certain season. Now you can, like, some say this is super uh, superstitious and, you know, it's really not doing this stuff and this and that. And, and honestly, I can't tell you if it is or not because there's nothing in Scripture that indicates that. Does God use angels to do things? By the way, who brought Israel the law? Angels did. In Galatians over there, it talks about uh, the, um, brought them the law by the uh, distribution of angels. 
So God does use angels, and it, this may clearly be God doing this, but why would he do it if they all can't get in? See, <laughs> anyway. So if you want to say it is, that's fine. I'm, I'm not a, my point is not that they're waiting, that God is doing the moving of the water and using the angels, because there's another guy on the scene that's using angels too, okay? The thing is, is what were they believing in? The wrong thing, <laughs> weren't they? They were believing in that if that water moves and we can get in there first, we're good. And the Messiah is standing there going, I got the living water. I'll give you something you're going to never thirst again, which is what he just told the Samaritan woman. And he looks across there. And again, verse 7, who's he trusting? I have no man. Israel, they get the law. The law comes in. And it provides, what does the law provide? Absolutely nothing for them. What did the Lord do? He comes in and gives them life and healing. What's the pool do? The pool, if they get in it, what do they got? Life and healing, right? But they can't get in it because they can't satisfy that activity. So it's going to be in Jesus Christ that salvation from the weak and the worst of them, for the weakest and the worst of them, is going to be, and it's going to end up being God's grace. And that's what we're going to see as we pick up and go on down through. Okay? The verse 5, let's just do that one real quick here. And a certain man... Um, by the way, in verse 4, they're made whole of whatsoever disease he had. See that whole, again, whole thing. Verse 5, And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. His situation is going to picture something. Come back to Deuteronomy chapter number 2. It's, it should not be lost on you and I that when the, when the book gives great detail then we need to take great care in looking at the detail. Look at Deuteronomy 2 and verse number 14. And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we were come over the brook Zered was thirty and eight years until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host as the Lord swear unto them. They leave... Egypt, they cross the Red Sea, he gives them the five tests in the wilderness, which they don't learn. That's the Jehovah compound names. They fail because at Mount Zion, they, he gives them the law, and they say, everything you say we can do, great, we can do it. They fail the five tests because they should have said, no, Lord, we can't do it, we need you. That's Jehovah, I am, fill in the blank. We didn't get that. He gives them the law. They wander around the world a little bit. They, they come up to the Kadesh Barnea. They're ready to go in. The 12 spies go in. What do they get back? Ten say no. Two say yes. The Lord says, nope, this generation won't go in and, and cut off. And he says, that's 38 years. To go from Kadesh Barnea to the time now ready to go in is how long? 38 years. Just the same number as the man here in John 5 who can't get in the pool. And they're wanting to get in the land. So the same time that Israel's wandering in the wilderness out there, by the way, after getting the law of Moses, we're in the five porches. We're impotent. It's not working. So this man re represents the spiritual condition of Israel under the law at the moment. They're impotent, they're blind, they're halt, they're withered, they're lame, they're waiting, they're looking for a hope in the wrong place. They're looking for God to, to move and to work in the wrong place, which is in their religion. Because what are they waiting for? God to come and zap the pool and hope that a good Samaritan comes along, picks me up, and throws me in, they're looking in the wrong place. In verse 7, when he says, no man, again, wrong place. 
So we'll pick up in verse 6. We'll see God's grace as God's grace comes in on the scene now and says, here we go. Okay? And now we're, now we're over the hour because we started late. Okay? So you have the grace of God come on the scene now. And there you're going to see him. By the way, he looks out across the great multitude in verse 3. Do you see that? Look at verse 3. In these lay a great multitude. And he sees one guy. And he pulls him out. The Lord looks across the great multitude of Israel and he calls out a believing remnant to make whole. He, he looks across and he finds the one guy that's going to believe his word. And you know how he believed his word? He took up his bed and left. That's how he believed his word. It's interesting, in all this, he didn't believe that Christ died on the cross for his sins. He did what the word said to him. The word standing in front of him said what? Arise and take your bed and go. And what did he do? Hang on a minute, I like it. It's comfy. No, he, he took off. The second issue that's going to be in here is the fact that Jesus Christ did this on the Sabbath. And he did it for a reason. He's picking a fight. And he's picking a fight with them. And it's going to become the beginning, really, of the open manifestation of the opposition to the Lord. Starts right here in number three. As the grace of God now begins to be taught and to be expounded and shared, the opposition to Him is going to pop up. And the source of the opposition is going to be that external, vain, empty, religious system that Israel has brought in and established and is running the show, okay? Christ is looking at the internal. They're looking at the external. And when they see him do this on the Sabbath, you thought, you, you thought he killed them. And they're just going to go in ballistic on it, and we'll, we'll get into all that, okay? Now I'm over three minutes, so. But that's what's coming. Really these two things. He looks out there. And he sees that multitude, and he picks the one guy out of it that's going to believe him. And then the Sabbath day, that reaction to the grace of God pops up. And it's not a love you, come and welcome, kumbaya. It's how do we kill him and not upset the people? And how can we get this done? And then, so real early, what are they beginning to do? Lay the groundwork to crucify him, to kill him. And it's right there. So, Okay. All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for the study, for the look at it, for the reminder of these events, and for the wonderful uh, manifestation of your grace as we see these guys as we move forward and we see this in this miracle. All for your glory and all for your honor. In your name we pray. Amen.